Hey, yo, my murder is rap, verbal Ladies attack, is actionable, fact, tactical, trap, match perfectly, but rap, I'm here. back, I'm 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 back, I'm
he could have gone into like more you know lyricist sort of style of hip hop if he wanted to. That's not where the money was, and I can't really fault him for. Older. I mean, listen, at the, I think it was the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. Um, I was there for the opening game of uh, Brazil against Croatia. And if I'm not mistaken, during the opening ceremony, Pitbull was on stage for that. Yes, he was. And I'm at the stadium looking, and it's like, here's a guy I went to high school with, and he's opening up a World Cup in Brazil. So I'm, I'm immensely proud of everything he's accomplished. <laughs> and that's the thing, with him being able to do just that and, and generate his own impact in the game. So for you... After Uncle Luke, who would be in your list of top five in Miami hip hop? Because Trick Daddy, obviously, and Trina got to make sure they're there. And how Trick is still so great slapping down Ron the Psycho. I mean, Ron DeSantis, but that's just my opinion. Not anybody else is here with that. But who's in your whole top five? And is the City Girls in there now? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing a Miami top five. That's too controversial. <laughs> <laughs> I think True Daddy's probably my favorite um, from down here. Um, but those, those went hard, man. And like, it goes back to like me playing you know, high school sports and listening to it you know, before and after practice and in the locker room to put myself up. Like, it was a lot of trick um, on rotation. Trick led the kids and we looked trick. In the locker room. So that means, Ray, you were balling. And was it soccer? Was it basketball? What were you balling with in, in high school, my man, or middle school, which, whichever it may be? In high school, it was American football. Um, I played at South Miami Senior High. Um, mm. Uh, and before that, and I played red basketball. Um, I actually didn't like fall in love with soccer until I was like 16, 17, 18 years old. That's when I like, started playing. Um, but I, you know, Cuba, uh, born in Cuba, my dad taught me baseball. That was my first love. I get to America and I sort of started embracing like American sports and American culture. I played everything from uh, baseball, basketball, um, college, uh, high school uh, uh, football. And then it wasn't until probably around 17 years old that I, I started to be exposed to soccer. It wasn't around Miami Fusion, weren't, weren't around at the time. And or, or, or on their way out, something along those lines. And, and I, I realized, like, wow, I need to learn about this. I need to make like, mm-hmm. this incredible. I played, and I was so bad. But I just, I, I fell in love with it from the first time that I played, like, a, a serious game of soccer. And I thought, like, I need to be good at this. And from there, I swear, I, I played every single day after that. Mm-hmm. Um, a park close to my parents' house where I would live. The pitch was in between like four baseball fields and it was bumpy and there was like no, none of it was even. It was all like sort of hilly and whatnot. And it became a really good place to learn, right? Because it's like street rules. You're just playing at the park. You're playing every single day. You go out there at the same time. There's a you know big group. Um, and I think the more I fell in love with soccer, the more that the rest of the sports just fell by the wayside. Whereas like now in, in professional sports, everything else is just kind of, um, I only have enough bandwidth for, for the soccer that I'm covering, whether it's City A, whether it was in 15 years I did with La Liga stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, I follow the other sports less now, um, and almost exclusively baseball soccer. Yeah, I mean, especially with the European schedule and how when you started at Goal TV, having La Liga and Serie A right there in that time zone difference, it certainly led to really being just vested into that. So what was the game or the moment where you fell in love at A16, particularly, of course, this 20th anniversary of now my favorite World Cup, which was the 02 um, World Cup, and, and we'll get into that for major reasons with it, but definitely a pivotal point for me to turn me in the direction of really being all in on the sport. But what for you was that moment where you said, I really do love this sport of soccer slash football? Yeah, so it was playing it first before watching it, and then um, once I got the chance to, like, once it was on TV, because you got to remember before, say, 2002, 2003, when Go TV came about and started showing people La Liga, uh, Serie A, and uh, Little League on the Bundesliga, um, and a lot of, like, Colombian League, Argentine League, Brazilian League soccer, it was hard back in the day to get, you know, soccer on TV, and uh, everybody has their stories, whether it's the Italians having to go to Rye to, to watch a crappy signal. <laughs> no. Nope. Stupidly in Italian, or I remember at the time, um, ESPN had the rights to the Champions League. They would air one game per week. One down. So yeah. rights, so nobody else could show it. It was always on a Wednesday. It was always, almost always Manchester United. So we got a huge head start when it came to the fan base. Yep, Tommy Smith with a Y. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think it was first playing it that really made me love it, and then when I, when it was finally on TV, watching a not very successful but very fun Barcelona team. With the likes of like Sonny Anderson and Patrick Kleiber, um, mm-hmm. how was, uh, was a coach back then. Um, Madrid were dominating, but, but that was an era of La Liga when like Valencia could win a title, 
and um, Real Sociedad was viable. Super Depot won a title. Depo, yep. So, Depo, me, yep. That's what it really made me sort of fall in love with the game globally beyond just, you know, going back to the local park and playing there. And that's the thing, man, where for you, when did it come to that moment where you said, I really want to have this passion for soccer and then for sports in general lead to the transition for broadcast? What was that whole path for you after high school that pushed you at least to go and in, in, in on that journey there? Yes, I, I knew I wanted to. I wanted to be a writer, right? So I thought, like, I wanted to be a, a novelist, and I figured, okay, well, that's not going to pay the bills, especially at first. So I need to like pick a career. Um, I thought, well, journalism will allow me to write. Um, I, I studied print journalism. I thought, okay, I'll be a you know sort of journalist by by day, novelist by night. Um, and it was while I was getting my my degree in journalism that I met uh, the legendary So Shane, um, mm. the sports director for my uh, radio station at my college, um, Florida International University. Which is blown up, by the way. It's, it's a, a big school now. It didn't feel big then. Um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty proud of the way that that school has grown up. Um, and so I was doing, you know, uh, everything: basketball, baseball, uh, soccer, uh, softball for the for the radio station. And the only thing that we would travel for, because that's where all the money was, was the football games, uh, mm -hmm. not soccer, but American football. Mm -hmm. And I was on a trip to the hometown of one Clint Dempsey, uh, Nacogdoches, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, going between FIU and Stephen F. Austin that I meet Phil Shane, he was doing the games professionally for radio, I was doing it for college, and we got to talking about soccer, he was the, we were the only two soccer fans on this entire trip, maybe us, playing Dempsey and his parents were the only soccer fans, mm -hmm. the entire city of Nacogdoches, um, and he just, you know, told me when you get back to Miami, talk to so-and-so with Home TV, maybe they have, you know, a production assistant job for you or something along those lines, and so I did, I reached out when I got back, um, I, I started working as a PA uh, at Home TV when I was still getting my degree, and just I knew that uh, I could pour myself into it. At that time, I did not have any um, idea that I would go into commentary. Uh, I think play by play commentary, especially, seemed like something that would be just difficult and, and uh, not really on my sights, not really on my radar. I was thought like, oh, I talk about for ninety minutes. It just it, it, I, I couldn't conceive of doing that professionally. Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, I'll be a journalist. I'll talk about the game. I'll do studio shows. I'll be a reporter. Uh, in two thousand and six, I got a chance to go and cover my first World Cup with um, Gold TV. Germany 06, not a great one for the U.S., uh, especially after, you know, the great one in 2002. Some really, you know, depressing memories about, you know, Gelsen Berry yeah. to the Czech Republic. Uh, the deal with both Thomas Rosicki and, 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 and Jan Kohler just crushing us that day. Pablo Neva didn't have to even do that much, him and Bergevniak. I mean, it was just, it was, that was a rough one there. Right. But I, I stuck around after uh, the U.S. Uh, elimination. I got a chance to go see um, Argentina, Netherlands. So I'm watching, you know, 17 year old Messi debut at the World Cup. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was a really fun experience. Uh, it was the first time that the Germans could be sort of, you know, proud of, of their nationality without seeming nationalist. And so it was this great sort of coming out party for the Germans. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just turned out to be a really fun World Cup for me, and, and was the very first big sort of milestone where I thought. Okay, cool. I need to try and do whatever I can to get to like the top level of this industry, mm -hmm. so that uh, I can come to events like these and cover them for free. And so, uh, you know, we've done a few since then, um, but that, I think around uh, two thousand and three, two thousand and four was so before that. That World Cup was the time when I said, okay, I want to launch a career in soccer. And in that regard, uh, both Phil Shane and uh, Ray Hudson, who I still work with, uh, he, he's my co-commentator for Inter Miami games, huge, huge part of my soccer education. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to, you know, be Phil or Ray. Uh, those guys have their own unique sound and their own uh, style. But in terms of, you know, I, I would listen to Ray talk about the game, and Ray had obviously played at a high level and coached in MLS. And I just, I, could, I knew, I could tell that he was seeing things that I didn't even know to look out for. Right? Mm. Like, there was, there, there's so much happening during the course of a soccer game. You know, thousands of things happening. Yes. And it, it, it takes a certain level of knowledge to know what to look for to understand. What's going on? Shabby has a famous quote that's a little disparaging, but I think some truth in it. Probably says that you know, ninety-eight percent of people love soccer, but only two percent understand it. Um, and I, I had that feeling with Ray, right? Like I liked the game, I, I enjoyed the game, but I could tell that I just did not understand it at the level that he did. Mm -hmm. And so both him and, and Phil had a lot to do with my soccer education, and I've um, been fortunate to work with just really knowledgeable people, whether it's journalists or, or former pros, who sort of shaped my understanding of the game and, and just made me hungry to learn more. And Xavi, I guess, is being um, Spanish generous because if he was the an NBA player here, NFL player, they'll be like, 
0.005 or just even lesser than that. Understand what it is. It's over on the side with the great Sir Andres Cordero. So when you made that transition back from the World Cup in 06, and before we talk about that transition, just one thing about that incredible World Cup in Germany, as you mentioned with Lionel Messi there, uh, you feel that Argentina really should have won that World Cup that year? Um, I think there's a couple of tournaments that Argentina should have done much better in, right? So um, yeah, the, the, that's the thing about the World Cup and the Champions League and any knockout tournament. It's it really is as much about the bounce of the ball at times as it is about the quality of the team, right? I, I would say that like every World Cup, there's probably three or four teams that are good enough to win it. Every Champions League tournament, there's probably you know five to six teams that are good enough to win it, and it really does come to uh, you know little moments here and there. One of the things that, that I love about our game that I love about soccer that just it doesn't exist in other team sports is it's the only game I can think of where you can outplay the opposition and lose, or you can you know play worse than the opposition and win. So going back to Ray Hudson, I, you know we would talk about how Rayo Vallecano, for example, could play toe to toe with a Barcelona or a Real Madrid, um, despite you know not having anything like the budget of being first first division tourists. And he just turned to me and said, "Andy, he's the only person outside of my family that calls me Andy." He says, "Andy." Whenever we figure out why any of this happens, it's time to turn off the lights and dedicate ourselves to horse racing. Right? Because I think, I think there's a certain magic to, to soccer, to our game, that like, just because you play better doesn't mean you win. Yeah. You can deserve to win and not, and deserving is not sort of mutually exclusive in our sport. Without a doubt, it is not, and what makes this game just so fascinating um, all the way, indeed, particularly for those that saw the Costa Rica-New Zealand uh, final World Cup. Um, deciding game for the final place with that and see the whole drama of what that was and how um, the Kiwis could say that they, you know, really were deserving of it but weren't able to get that in the end over penalties. Over deserving of it is your whole journey, good sir, because after FIU, and by the way, you can certainly say FIU greater than U of M if you went to <laughs> uh, without a doubt there. Um, with the Gold TV before being sports, in that whole journey where you had La Liga off the bat, where you had Syria off the bat, dealing with all that and making that whole way to to be in, how for you was that transition, calling games remotely, and just the shape of how Gold TV was until it was time to roll over to BN. And with Gold TV, by the way, people, it's still on the air, especially if you love Liga, BWIN, Liga Portugal, over there. You can see your Benfica, Porto, Sporting Lisbon, Braga. Yeah, so it was incredible. It was a really good um, really experience. Uh, it was uh, by the old channel, so it still is. Um, so they would air games, one video signal, two audio signals, one in Spanish, one in English. And we had um, just some of the greatest... Spanish language um, journalists working for that for that channel, right? Guys like um, Martin Charquero, Oscar Estrepo, Eduardo Vizcayar. Yeah. And the guys who, like, you know, people who watch the games in Spanish would recognize these names or read Argentines and Colombians and Uruguayan um, commentators and journalists. And so I felt like I had this incredible education where I was not just learning about the game, but I was learning about broadcasting from both uh, the Latin American, the, the South American perspective, and the American perspective. Um, and a European perspective, given you know the things that we were covering, and so now when I think about the way that I do commentary, I feel like I got a chance to sort of cherry pick the things that I love about the sort of excitement and passion that the game is covered with in Spanish, but then a little bit more of the um, you know not lying to people, <laughs> which, which is you know sometimes when you watch a, Sp uh, a Spanish commentary for a game or an Italian commentary for a game, it does feel like the commentator is a little bit lying in terms of the the, the excitement and the enthusiasm. So I was just able to sort of merge, you know, what I loved about one side of it with what I loved about the other, just kind of try and create my own unique approach to, to commentary into the game. So Gold TV had a lot to do with that. The fact that during any, uh, we used to do a show, a, a weekly recap on Sunday nights. It was two hours. It was called um, A Total Gold, and at one time it got sponsored by Volkswagen, so we called it Volkswagen Gold. <laughs> two-hour highlight recap of basically anything we can get our hands on. Yep. If it was a Romanian second division, we'd show you the Romanian second division. Like, it just, whatever we could cram into two hours of goals and highlights. Um, and during those shows, which were off camera, I was exclusively VL, we would do live, and I would have, 
my Spanish producer, my English producer, the Spanish talent, and my um, co-host, all in my ear at the same time. That's what I've got me to just sort of like work within or to learn to work within the chaos that live games and live shows, you know, can throw at you. Because you know, some people get phased and they, you know, take their piece out because there's too much going on. I mean, it's concentrated on. I, I learned to like operate under that chaos and help me tremendously going forward. Sure did, man, because you're one of the coolest people on air in terms of just keeping that same quality tone and still getting the excitement in there with that. As we fast forward to be in and all the way through, shout out to the great Sir George D. Metellus, our good guy right there. You talk about that bond that you had with George over these whole years and how, you know, getting into this whole thing down there in the 305. Yeah, George is brilliant, man. Like, we, we worked together at, um, at Bull TV, um, carried over to, to be in sports. So up until I left BN, um, what, last, just before last summer, uh, we basically worked together from 2004 until just about last year. And so we went on a lot of that journey uh, together. Um, so he'll, he'll know the sort of the pain and the joys of both Bull TV uh, and BN sports. But more broadly, the, the people that, that I worked with at BN, I'm just immensely proud of, of how many of, of those um, commentators and journalists have gone on to do big things, right? I think about, like, I don't want to start naming people and forget names, but there are, but there are you know, a handful that um, really influenced me and, and just made me want to be better. And made, So some of them I still work with now. Ian Joy, for example, was up in Connecticut working as It's a big part of the reason why I do commentary. Um, at the time, I was working as a, as a presenter in studio for being around 2012, and uh, Ian was the one was pushing me in the direction of doing some some commentary. I said, you know what, let's do it. Uh, we did my first game for Ian was with Ian. It was right away I got with Madrid in La Liga. I'll never forget it. it was terrible. I was, that's really that was garbage. But I walked out thinking that that was the most fun that I've had covering the sport, like outside of going to a World Cup or a Copa America. Didn't see good at that, and that's where I focused my attention after that. I knew from then on that I wanted to be a play-by-play commentator. Ian had a lot to do with that. Um, K. Murray, who's over at ESPN now, my, my current commentator, a uh, co-commentator at CBS Sports with Serie A, Matteo Bonetti. These are people like Kevin Egan, who I worked with uh, briefly at, at uh, BN Sports and sort of, you know, helped me when I was getting into um, MLS with Inter Miami. He was working at uh, Atlanta United, he's now working with WWE. It's just just great uh, mass of, of people who um, are around my age, um, who were at BN Sports at the same time and you know, went on to do big things and, and are doing big things now. And just really, somebody called us, uh, somebody called me in sports the IX of uh, sports uh, television because oh. it was a launch pad for a lot of us. It sure was, and considering where you all are at today and you dealing with Sir Benetti all the way, once again, on a regular basis as well with that. How is him doing it? Does he try to mask the AC Milan love? enough does he try to mask that all the way with it well he's, he's a professional but during, during games uh, mm-hmm. you, you won't get any of that but i think if you talk to him outside of it or in shows and try and bring it out a little bit more because it's we're not kidding anybody like we're fans of the game we, we cover it professionally and i think you know too much is made of, you know, of, of biases and whatnot like if you cover the game professionally and you are fair that's all that anybody is, is required to be fair yeah. you're required to be impartial you're required to be fair um and i think he does a great job with that and, and he and i so we had to pinch ourselves this year with um, CBS Sports because we we were doing at being you know three to five games per week uh, across Serie A, La Liga, French Liga, and Turkish Super. And Serie A was the bulk of our work, and we would do maybe two, three Serie A games every single week. And we did something on Sundays called multi council So the Serie A would schedule five games all kicking off basically at the same time at nine a.m. Eastern time, and we would do a whip around show but instead of how almost all whip around shows are with like a studio host or a studio panel and then they cut into the different uh commentaries we'd actually do the commentary for one main game and then ourselves cut into the other games so you really have to know the league well enough to like all of a sudden cut into the stadium with Nicole and Turin under that penalty was what we just scored um as opposed to having that information all sort of delegated so it was a challenge, but it was a lot of fun because you walk out after a two-hour broadcast where you call maybe 18 goals because you were covering three to five games uh, simultaneously. Uh, so we went from that and, and all of those games to now getting the opportunity to travel to Italy to call games from San Siro, to call games from the Allianz Stadium. We did the uh, Milan Derby this year on site. Uh, we took an entire studio crew. Uh, we did the uh, Milan Napoli game. Uh, the Italia, which was just a bucket list item for me. From the Allianz Stadium, 
Uh, to, to do those games with Mateo, considering sort of we got our start considerably in the same place in that league, uh, it meant a lot. And I think it, it was sort of a dream for us to to see this progression to get to the point now where American commentary teams are getting the opportunity to go to Europe and call games from stadiums, from some of the cathedrals of world football. As long as he doesn't get at Marco and Sir Grilla too much on set, as he can tend to do all the way with this. And, you know, you have to console him for Italy missing two consecutive World Cups, which is wild. So, at the very least, he can become an honorary Englishman, which is something he never would want to hear, but to support his whole wife's country in terms of Kay Murray at the World Cup uh, with that. The rest of that CBS team, good sir, I'm going to ask you, because you mentioned meeting Clint Dempsey back when you were at FIU in terms of traveling on the road, going to Nacogdoches, Texas. Did he remember that whole entire elite journey and all that? So, so I didn't meet him there. Uh, that was just um, uh, a game I went to go do for FIU against Stephen at Boston. Okay. I met, the, I met uh, Dempsey for the first time uh, during the Nations League um, finals last summer. We went to Denver. It was uh, me and Maurice and Duong Nepal. Mm -hmm. And then obviously uh, Kate Abdo on set with uh, Clint Dempsey, Abu Chunyu, with Charlie Beatties. Um, uh, Jenny was with us as well mm -hmm. as, as the reporter. Um, but it was that first night that we were there, all the hotel chatting that um, that I got a chance to talk to, to, to Clint about Nakatoches and how weirdly enough, like my soccer career started or was launched by a chance meeting in Nakatoches, Texas. <laughs> but the, the cool thing about that group and one of the things that I think Pete Radovich and CBS have done really, really well is they they do their homework when it comes to putting uh, their groups together, whether it's the Champions League crew, whether it's the USA crew, whether it's the City A crew, and there really are no bad apples. Everybody gets along tremendously. It's good chemistry. It's people who know their stuff um, and can be loose with it. Can have fun because sports journalism is supposed to be fun and is sometimes a little too buttoned up, a little bit too suited. Um, mm -hmm. So they're taking it in a different direction, right? A bit of that like there's an NBA vibe um, to to a lot. Of which is probably the best soccer, uh, sports show on television. Unquestionably. Um, and so, yeah, those, those guys, specifically the U.S. national team guys, um, I've spoken to more, you know, we've done some, like, trial games remotely just to sort of get to know each other, uh, but haven't worked together before. And the very first night we were there, it was like you were just catching up with old friends as opposed to meeting people for the first time. And so the vibe was always right. Um, it's happened, you know, time and time again. It happened there. It happened with the City Ad Crew. Um, we've all traveled together now and sort of got to know each other. But I think the best thing that they've done is the, the teams that they've put together just really work and really click really from day one. And without a doubt, especially when you had that wonderful arm wrestling challenge between Gucci Onyewu and, of course, Micah Richards after Micah went and did that to Moe Du in terms of the arm wrestling and how classic that night was. Can you shot how fun the atmosphere that was that night, especially with Kate certainly knowing how to egg on a situation as she tend to do in terms of the quality times with that. How fun was that night for sure to have go down? It was fun, but it was also tense. Like, yes. They, they wanted to win. Like, Micah and Gooch were, were not backing down. There was some controversy at first because, uh, <laughs> you know, Micah is, like, as strong, I think, with his left as he is with his right. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that he got Mo is that he, he got Mo to arm wrestle with his left. And, like, Mo was already the disadvantage. He had the advantage on him. And now you got to go with left-handed where, you know, he felt like he was hard done by it. Micah tried to pull the same thing with Gooch, and Gooch wasn't backing down. So uh, we're all looking at each other like, is this going to go down? Like, are they actually going to do it? Or is this going on a little, little longer than it should? Uh, finally, Micah just relented and they went right handed, and, and Gooch redeemed the, um, the proud status of the United States uh, by being Micah Richards in an all wrestling contest. Yeah, that was epic towards it. And you getting over this last year from the Nations League semifinals and finals to now to work with Moe Du. How great has that partnership been in terms of it with Moe? He's incredible. I, I think he has everything to be, he already is one of, but I think he has everything to be the best sort of uh, color commentator, American voice in, in, in U.S. soccer. Um, he works uh, just incredibly hard. Uh, he, he's tireless. He's uh, flying back and forth between like L.A. and uh, Atlanta to do the Atlanta games. He's, he's working for Fox. He's working for CBS. So he's got his money in everybody's pockets. Um, but uh, he's a you know, smart guy. Obviously knows the game tremendously. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have three regular 
color commentators were all terrific and all very, very different, right? So I do the Inter Miami games with Ray Hudson, I do the uh, City A games with Matteo Bonetti, and I've done the USA games uh, with Moedu. And I learned from all three of them, um, not just about the game, but also about broadcasting. Um, they've, got, they've got very different personalities, very different pacing. And so it challenges me to, to sort of meet the moment and, and to, to adjust uh, so that the broadcast overall and my, and my color commentator especially comes out looking as good as possible. For you, final two questions that I got for you. As you mentioned, Inter Miami, not only Ray Hudson doing his thing, but also Kaylin Kyle doing her thing and being everywhere with that. How's it been in regards to the team that you've had with Inter, with the magisterial Ray and Double K um, doing her thing and representing for Saskatchewan? So Kaylin's another one uh, of the BN sports people, right? She was at BN with us uh, briefly on the stream a little bit after. Um, and uh, we've had the opportunity to work there together. She joins us on the inaugural uh, Inter Miami team, the, which basically we already knew each other. We were already sort of national broadcasters, me, Ray, and, and Kaylin. So it was such a natural fit and so comfortable that we hit the ground running with Inter Miami. And it was a difficult first season, obviously, because it's an expansion team. Um, two games into the season, COVID hits the, the two months or so. Um, and so it was a really challenging uh, first season, first couple of seasons, to be honest. Um, but we had so much fun and continue to have so much fun in the broadcast that you know, it, it's a local broadcast. So unless you're in South Florida, you're, uh, maybe you're getting it on ESPN Plus when we're the board of the home teams. Um, but you can just tell that it's a little bit of a different approach to, to the commentary. Kaylin becomes almost a, you know, the, the third person in the booth, even when she's uh, sideline first, pitch side. She's giving you you know, tactical insight, because having played the game, I'd be the former candidate. Um, and, you know, we, we just, again, try and be as fun as possible, follow Ray's lead, get out of his way when he's on a roll, uh, <laughs> because he's the most entertaining person in uh, soccer broadcasting. And just, again, blessed to, to be part of incredible teams and, and to continue to grow because of it. Let me ask you, sir, because you've seen some quality success down there in Miami in terms of your sports teams. Uh, with it from the Marlins being an early expansion team to them winning a title in recent years of their existence with that and having the influence of Levon Hernandez right there on that team. Of course, the Dolphins, Dan Marino, and the Heat doing their thing. No offense to the Florida Panthers as well, too. So for you, what has been your most favorite of all the Miami sports teams in your lifetime down there? And I was lucky enough to have um, season tickets for um, the entirety of Miami's uh, Big Three era. So we, my, my wife um, got me a big birthday present, uh, season tickets for the Heat, when literally the only person on the Heat roster was Gerald Anthony. <laughs> Pat Riley had cleaned out the roster. It was such a big free agency year, right? Like Wade was a free agent, Washington was a free agent, LeBron was a free agent. And so, just in a stroke of genius, uh, Pat Riley completely clears out the roster. Joel Anthony is the only person on the roster, and that's when we bought season tickets. A month later is the decision. You know, Wade signs, Bosch signs, um, and the, sh the tickets shot up 30% like that next day. And so, for the entirety of that run, I had uh, tickets to the Miami Heat. I, I was, it was the center of the basketball universe for, you know, good four years. We were the finals, won a couple of those. I was at the... Um, I was at the Ray Allen three-point shot game where uh, they were bringing out the, the trophy. They brought the rope out. They give the trophy to San Antonio. And uh, Bosch tips the rebound over to Ray Allen for that corner three. I, I actually, I'm, I'm at the stadium, at, or at the arena. I missed it a lot of time because I was looking down, like, head in my hands. Basically, it's over. We're done here. At least you didn't walk out and leave like some Heat fans were doing. <laughs> no, no, I was still in the building, but I had to, like, look at the replay on the big screen. Because I was like, <laughs> the sound of it uh, to, to avoid that defeat it's just but that team um, that's a core memory for me honestly like even though I was already in the Gulf like they it was the most fun I've had uh, you know following sports in South Florida and, and I think you would know this like Miami fans are at their best when the rest of the nation hates us right so you think about like the UMK you know, 2000 2001 just hated nationwide yep. and down and loved it. same thing with the Miami Heat uh, a little less so with the Marlins they were a little bit more teams they tend to be young teams uh, but when, when the rest of the country hates Miami Miami's having the most fun that is indeed indeed well great sir Cordero we can talk many more times with that but we have to go on this one but you as always a great sir always one of the quality people in general not only 
in soccer football media, been in all sports media, man. And just good to really be a quality colleague and know you, my man. And to close, oh, you want to say something before you close, Andre? Just I appreciate you, man. Like we um, obviously we've known each other through Twitter for a long time. This is the first time that we get to really chance to, to, to chat uh, in depth like this. So I appreciate it, and uh, hopefully it's not the last time. Definitely, where especially if you are up here, you and your family, you get a chance to come to at least a Fat Joe or Thursday Golf event. We gotta bring you there with this or any quality New York rat with this. This honorary New Yorker with him dropping that classic hip hop knowledge with it. The great Scott Trump Cordero, but showing his own global music internet. This is Black Sheriff, Black Golden Traveler. We close it now, ladies and gentlemen, on this edition of Football Overtime. Get this back on replay in a few hours on Believe Network. Until then, bye-bye from us here on Overall Overtime. Black Cordero, Andrew Jones, we out. Bye-bye, y'all. But I keep going, no. More like a rock.